It's my pleasure now to introduce Mark Fishman, who will be chairing our first science panel. Mark also needs no introduction, but I'm very pleased in many ways to have him, have him here back at Harvard. He's an exemplification of what this area can do. Mark was an outstanding cardiologist, chief of cardiology, an outstanding developmental biologist, went to Novartis where he recreated a very important pharmaceutical research endeavor right in our backyard. He had the wit to bring it here. And I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome him back to Harvard. And I look forward to the insights of you and your panel for telling us about what the latest and greatest is in, regen in regenerative medicine. Great. Thanks very much. Vicki and I taught a course together, which is really a wonderful way to get to know someone. And uh, I've remained a great admirer of her lucidity as well as her own uh, scientific expertise. So thank you very much. I'll just take a couple of minutes to try to put a little perspective on the meeting. The goal of regenerative medicine is to restore organ form and function when it's been damaged by genetics uh, or uh, inflammation or, or trauma. I might turn down the mic a little. I'm getting a little feedback, yeah? Uh, and, and, and we've made great progress, and then Larry started that discussion. But I just keep in mind that the embryo does this pretty effortlessly. And all we're trying to do in some ways is capture what the embryo does. The axolotl and my favorite organism, the zebrafish, can do very well if you lop off a limb or a piece of the heart. It, even as an adult, it will grow back. So we know this can be accomplished, and there's every reason to be optimistic. Uh, second point I want to make is I know we're at the business school. And I look out and I see my friend Shrikant, so I, I have to tell you, please don't do an economic analysis on today's events. It is too early for net present value. Uh, you don't know any of the components of that equation, which Srikant taught me. But what you can ask is two questions. Is there an unmet medical need that could be addressed, and is it scientifically tractable? And the answer to both questions is absolutely yes. The unmet need, you'll hear from our panel, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, 12 million people, 10% of the population with diabetes. Uh, blindness uh, from macular degeneration is the most common cause of, in the Western world of blindness. And aging, which is something that I don't like talking about as much as I used to, uh, is upon us. Every eight seconds, someone in the United States uh, turned 65. You know, in 1900, there were only 4% of the population that were over 65. It's now 20%. And with that comes fragility, uh, forgetfulness, uh, and a dependence and incapacity that you'll hear uh, Jenna and others describe how we can potentially get around. So it's a tremendous need. But let me suggest to you, and those of you in biotech especially, that we may not start by testing the drugs and the cells in these big populations. We probably should begin in more homogeneous, targeted populations. And so I think you have to realize that that will then extend well after that into the broader populations. Uh, today's most of the focus is on cell therapy. I call that the uh, spare parts approach to regenerative medicine. <clears throat> Taking in a cell, changing its fate, or inducing a fate, and having it restore a certain level of function. Uh, and I'm a fan of that. Uh, we, we did a lot in, the, in Nibber, uh, matapoietic stem cells, and using CART cell therapy, and worked in tendon repair, muscle repair, a lot, a lot of that. Uh, but being an emigre from pharma, I, I do have to put it in a little bit of perspective that I hope you keep in mind with each of the speakers here today, too, because we're not done. In terms of safety, we still have to deal with the possibility of clonal expansion and cancers. And you'll hear from the speakers today how we have to think about that. Uh, we still need to deal with immunosuppression, in most cases, if we're using embryonic stem cells uh, for allografts. But I think that's all achievable. What you may not be as aware of is the very boring 
but difficult part of manufacturing these cells, distributing these cells, doing quality control, what's called CMC in, in, in the ARGA. It's uh, tedious, but you have to think about, is it going to be easily scaled up? Will it be centralized as a, in a certain facility? Will it be point of care? These problems, which are not in the bailiwick of most of us as academic scientists, become often the, the most severe impediment to making things happen. And then finally, I think the most important and interesting uh, scientific problem in terms of the efficacy is how we restore organotypic function. It's one thing to put in a bunch of cells if you have cells that can act independently. For example, in David's work, if you have hematopoietic stem cells, or in Doug's, maybe an isolated pancreatic cell. But for most of, the, most of the purposes, you need to restore some type of organotypic function. And it'll be interesting to think about how do we deal with the heart when we're trying to get a conduction system that works without, uh, without an arrhythmia, for example, or a lung, or a kidney, or a liver, which is totally dependent upon having a structure with different faces to cells, uh, canaliculi, uh, air coming in, fluid interface. These are not trivial. Well, this will bring us, of course, to bioengineering and to possibilities that we need to think about in terms of combining uh, mathematics, engineering prowess, in a, uh, what is now called conversion science, to make this happen. And I believe that this type of biology will be the place where it happens the most. Uh, so where, where are we going with this? Well, I believe a lot of what you'll hear today will be translatable rather quickly to the clinic. Uh, and I believe that regenerative medicine will be the third great wave of medicine. After infectious disease therapies in the 40s, cancer therapies over the last couple of decades that have revolutionized medical care, I believe regenerative medicine will and has to be, especially because of aging and degeneration, has to be the great next frontier. We have no choice. We have to make this work. And that's point number one. Point number two is there's a whole other wave of regenerative medicine that will be less discussed today and may ultimately subsume cell therapy. So as opposed to the spare parts, it's what I call the extended warranty approach. The idea that one could, for example, have a drug that could extend lifespan, that hasn't really worked so well. Red wine, unfortunately, failed. In bigger trials, rapamycin, works in some species better than in, in others. Uh, the man in Java who lived to be 145 was able to do it because he gave up unfiltered cigarettes. <laughs> so there are opportunities. I mean, the sharks can live to 400, so there are sharks around now that were around when the Puritans first came. So it's not that it's impossible, but it's tricky. I do think, though, we will be seeing the ability to have, we will have medicines that capture the intrinsic ability of stem cells in their niche uh, to expand using the local geographic information, anatomical information that's there, and restoring function. We know this pretty well for high turnover state uh, organs such as the skin or the gut, but I believe that there will be agents that will be able to capture the kinds of processes that the axolotl does so naturally or the zebrafish does so naturally and restore the function of organs that are injured but still have enough residual function and residual cells there to grow back. That may be done by medicines, that may be done by gene therapy, but I think those kinds of, that wave, which I think will follow the cell therapy wave, will ensure that regenerative medicine takes its place as the next great, great wave of medical therapy. Thank you. Now <laughs>